Okay, great. Thank you, Ms. Arani. So good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to Ivan's track. And uh, we are here today to share with you insights about the China markets. Actually, during today's session, a lot of uh, customers come to me and say they invest in China in 2021 and now already made around like 50, 60 percent loss. So I think firstly, we, we definitely feel the same in China. So the last few years, China market is not performing as what we expected, especially in 2023 after COVID, the recovery is not as expected. But you know, now still in Thailand, there are around 4 billion USD investments to the China markets. And we understand that China is going through the transition from a very infrastructure investment driven economy to a consumption driven economy. So the question is number one, is China still investable? And number two, if we still want to invest, what is the best way to tap into the China markets? So today I'm very honored to have two experts uh, from our company, one from Active Equity and one from uh, Passive. So I think both of you, uh, both of the colleagues will provide you, you know, insights to the China markets. So let's make the session as interactive as possible. So just interrupt anytime if you have questions. Okay, so let's start. Okay, the first question, let's refresh our memory about the macro discussion this morning. So if you use one keyword to describe China economy 2024, what would you be? So let's start with Bing. <laughs> so yeah, if I use one word, it's yes. recovery. And if you allow me to use two words, then it's gradual recovery, 2024. I think that's a good start, so I'll follow. So first one from Pujia is recovery. I'll start with our words, so uh, it'll be rebalancing for me. And what's, what's the other one? Gradual recovery. Gradual recovery, so for me that's growth. I think that's a key word for China. Yeah. Sounds, um, sounds confident and, and proactive, I think, positive. So uh, I think in the in the morning session, uh, being mentioned that in 2024 our GDP target is around five percent, which was also confirmed by the two sessions. So can you elaborate more about the composition? So how are we going to achieve this five percent? Wow. Uh, so first, I'd like to thank you for the opportunities I can be in these close to meetings. So uh, my personal view is going to be five percent growth for China economy will be challenging. So even for the year 2023, many people already giving many angles to talk about what is the real China GDP growth. Whether that can be four or five percent. I mean for these years, a typical decomposition of uh, of growth is gonna be coming from exports, net exports, coming from consumption and coming from investment. And I do see headwinds for all three elements. But investments, there's many data or topics that China already having a high leverage ratio. Basically meaning the debt ceiling issues. Although there's not, not a ceiling, but for municipal government, the central government, even for the household, because that's highly related to the uh, property sectors can be a challenging issue. For confidence on consumer, although during the Chinese New Year, we see a sharp rebound in consumption data. But from my point of view, what I really care about is the structure. Typical, chi typical Chinese household spends more on goods, not so much on services. I'm sure everyone understands the difference between goods and services. Because they have a different sensitivities to CPI, PPI, and global risk environments. But now I will say, comparing with the global peers, Chinese consumption still have a very large portion is on goods service. A good sign is the Chinese earnings typically related to the CPI and PPI. I see a sign of China CPI and PPI reaching the bottom. So my first assumption is the China CPI will bounce back, at least as a seasonality issue. That's the first thing I want to watch. 
for import and exports because of the macro environments for the past two to three years, the net exports for China economy is actually at a stable stage. Although in the meantime, most of the net exports already shifting from North America or Europe focused to the Southeast Asia and the Belt and Road focused. So as myself, my interest is very attached to Thailand market. Because that's the area that Chinese people come here or go without a visa. Chinese people love to come to Thailand to do service, not just goods, service consumptions. And in my opinion, that would be a very healthy pattern of what's going on. So that's, uh, that, that's my three, uh, three, three, three points. Sure. Mm -hmm. I think. Uh, Obviously, Bing provided his uh, view from the top-down level, maybe allow him to add from a bottom-up perspective, from a mi uh, more micro observation. Obviously, last year, as uh, Jingjing has already mentioned, uh, the China economy missed expectation by slower than expected recovery. So why did I say 2024 is a gradual recovery? Why could I be confident? What we observe from the company level is that last year, companies were also very confident, so they increased their capex investment, they hired a lot of staff, but then, of course, we know the result. It was, uh, you know, earnings was dropping because the demand was very sluggish. So what we think this year onward is that now the companies also realizing China is going through this economic transition, which will take time to go, then they are slowly slowing their investment and costs. So you see a lot of cost reduction on the micro level, uh, actually you know, uh, cutting people or reducing their expenses. Although the headline is gradually you know, coming back, we do see profits are improving. China, you know, the whole market sentiment is very correlated to policy support. So I would like to, you know, talk about, about policy. You know, from the two sessions, we observed that the government announced the deficit ratio about 3%, which is in line with last year. But overall, I think the market actually expects more expanding and aggressive physical policy. So could you please um, elaborate more on the physical policy support? Yeah, policy support. By the way, you just reviewed our plan after work. <laughs> <laughs> for, for policy support, uh, once again, that's my personal personal take. Number one is for this year, our investment ideas should not be highly rely on policy stimulus. We should be really looking for some industries or companies can deliver a high quality growth, which is also less sensitive to policy environments. Number two, from the two sessions, or from actually the overall policy trending for the last one or two years, what I think is the policy makers were making a relatively conservative stance on policy stimulus. Basically, we can take one step back, think of why or what the purpose of the policy supports. <coughs> is that the policy supposed to making the markets going to I don't think so. That's all the role That's all of the China financial markets, fundamentally, I think, will be two parts. Number one is helping the China economy going through the transition. Number two, is making China investors or ordinary household enjoy the wealth effects. For policy support, number one, I think that will be mild. But in the necessary time, there will be policy support to help the markets not going into a death spiral stage, as mentioned this early morning. That's why we see the special government bonds and help release the burden of the municipal government. But other than that, personally, I don't think the policy from China is going to be similar to what the US 
or Japan does during the pandemic or during the past 30 years. Because there's multiple constraints for China policies. You already can name something. FX stabilities, FX rates, debt ratio, leveraging ratio, common prosperities. All of these meaning for policy makings, they do need a fine tune in some cases. The third point is rebalancing. I mentioned about rebalance. Some industries in the past five to 10 years really enjoyed the old engine of China growth. For them, I think it will be a hard time for the next three to five years. That's probably will become a traditional industry. For example, property sectors or traditional consum consumption sectors, they may go through a stage of lower expectation on growth rates. For manufacturing sectors, or even internet sectors, they may, they may be at par, meaning they will not enjoy a 20-ish or even 30% growth as what they did in the past 10 years. But there are going to be emerging sectors or industries. Like during the two, the, the two sessions, a new phrase has been brought up, new quality productive force. Many clients is, up, is actually asking us, what does that mean? What I think that does that mean is, number one, it needs to follow the policy I'll see the destination or the angles so that they can support the policy tailwinds. That's number one. Number two, they should be able to have a business model or at least the potential areas of growth to support employment. Number three, they need to be able to fully utilize what we call the engineering bonus, the Chinese educate. The, the people, the workforce. And uh, last but not least, that should be able to help Chinese economy to have a competing power in the global arena. So for, for these, of course, there are going to be more alpha opportunities than just a broad-based data, which uh, I think Fujia can definitely shed more light on. Yeah. And, and just quickly on the, the real estate uh, being just touch, because um, I think transition, this keyword has been brought from multiple times, and we all understand that the real estate used to be the key engine for Chinese economy. You know, the so whole supply chain accounts for more than a quarter of China's GDP. But in the new normal situation, that the real estate is going down, and seems like it has been the drag for Chinese economy for the uh, last few years and we have her Evergrande, we have her others. So what is the current situation for you know, real estate sector in China? And what is the current situation for those real estate players? Um, are they, you know, the debt issues still be uh, something very serious to consider? So to echo what uh, Bing was mentioning about, you know, uh, the old driver would not work or carry forward China going forward, Property is definitely one of the old economy growth driver. So from policy perspective, it is to provide bottom line support rather than to stimulate the growth. So I think with that in mind, for property sector, as you have all known, in the last three years, Chinese government has been committed to deleveraging in the sector. And you see uh, you know, names we already mentioned having bankruptcy or you know, close to bankruptcy. So the message is very clear. So going forward, we will make this sector as market-driven as possible. So meaning that the high quality POE, as well as SOE, you know, if they, as long as they stand to deliver, as long as they can sell their new homes, then you know, they stand to stay. And they need to also upgrade their business model to provide better quality services. However, you will see some low quality POEs leaving the market, 
which we think uh, for very long term, this is a better shift for the China economy. So uh, just to uh, you know, draw your attention to the very near term, uh, what's going on for the real estate sector, actually uh, the government just announced what we call the three new projects, which is really uh, like concentrated on refurbishing the low, uh, low, income, uh, per, per, low income people's houses and also renovating the urban houses. So all these measures will help support you know, from a bottom line perspective. But again, let me reiterate, we do not think real estate sector will be the growth engine anymore for China economy. Did you have something to add? So in the past, especially after China joined the WTO, the property markets, the valuation for property markets is not only just the fundamental needs for people to live it. There's a lot of financial instrument valuations coming into the markets, which is also typical for, for emerging markets. So now, what's happening in China is the property sectors, their valuation is going back to what the fundamental needs can support. Meaning the, the, the valuation premium from the financial vehicles or instruments is gradually fading away. The difference is, is just that this is happening in China, in China rather quick. Rather quick, comparing with what happened in the US and, uh, and uh, Japan. And uh, if, uh, if we study the pattern of what's happening in Japan or, or in the US, seems like there's still room of further corrections for the markets. And I believe that's one of the reasons why we have a special bond issuing in China to help mitigate the risk too much associated with that. And also probably the sectors I mentioned earlier of the three categories, that they probably will, will not enjoy what happened in the past few years. But in the meantime, if you study what happened in the in let's say Singapore markets, actually property or REITs investment is a good vehicle to generate an income. Meaning after the correction in China markets finished, the property sectors, especially the REITs reform in China, may probably bring a new investment tool, especially for people looking for income solutions. That's something we're gonna be uh, keep a very close look on for the next stage. Great. Um, so at the beginning, I promise I will make this uh, session is as interactive as possible. And I understand a lot of investors um, do concern about the real estate in China. So I would like to open the question to the floor to see if anyone have um, questions you want to ask right now. Yes, please. <coughs> Do you have any concern about like the structural change in China, like the demographics and the way they have slower growth? How China can be like um, have advantage in the battle between other countries? Yeah, like 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 how competency is China still having? Yeah, I think it's a very good questions. Normally for investments especially from uh, my buy side angle. Demographic change is a, is a rather long factor. It doesn't drive the price movement for the next like, one, one to three months. But in the long run, I do see China already passing along the Lewis point since uh, 2011. Now I do see there is a uh, side effect reviewing in the society. So what's, ha what's happening in China now is that uh, we have a rather aging working force. In the meantime, the unemployment rates for the younger generation is also facing some challenges. I think what, what, what's all about this is also what I mentioned earlier in this morning session, is about the margin crunch for Chinese uh, entrepreneurs. Basically, they, they don't enjoy the margin as what they enjoyed before. What is the way to deal with this? Number one, the technology. 
technology lifting up the productivities, then going to deliver the margin. Number two, going abroad. This is also what happened for the US and uh, Japan as well. Going abroad, if you are truly a global player, meaning you, you do your business not based on some like protections or whatever, you will be able to find your opportunities in the global markets. Number three, animal spirit from the entrepreneur, which I guess is going to be manufacturers to come in to that animal spirit. But once again, during the rebalancing stage, there may be some short-term painful times. I don't, I don't want to paste a very colorful pictures for everybody. Going through a rebalancing stage has never been easy for any economy. But at the same time, I'm actually quite confident in the business. I would understand now is I do see there's many new business opportunities I'm never going to do enjoy in the past few years. Number one, from what we work on, asset management industries. We do see foreign players coming in, bringing in new competitions and new business models. I work for them the passive passive investment. So for ETF area, I do work on quite a few projects to connect in China to the global players. Our CEO mentioned to us, the whole world is going to a more transparent and more rule-based environment. That's actually going along with what ETF stands for. So connecting China with Middle East, with Thailand, with Asian countries, with BRICS countries, there's a lot of things we can do. Another opportunity is, once again from the buy side point of view, the depressed valuation. It really depends on whether you believe investment is all about being rewarded. That's always my call. You can either have your call that the world order or the invest paradigm has totally shifted, meaning there's no mean. You wouldn't reverse back to an old mean. You need a new win. But to me, it seems like the world is still going through a mean rewarded. Past two years, China market is going down. Uh, I also studied Thailand market also going down. But that's all in a relevant term. I Meaning other markets is going so good. Same thing happened in 1990, 27, 2017. Chinese market also gone through the downside. But other markets globally at that time enjoy very high correlation. Since pandemic, the correlation between China markets and the rest of the world since about shooting up. So that's two sides of the coins. You're either taking that as, okay, China is not investable anymore. I shouldn't touch that. Or you're taking that China is actually adding more value on the diversification side. And to me, I never, I never underestimate the diversification function of the world's second largest GDP. I think I just want to add my two cents as well to remind the audience China's competitive advantage. First of all, we are the largest, well, okay, overrun by India now, by population, 1.4 billion population, which means we have a very deep and large market for any global enterprise or domestic enterprise to play it in. And secondly, we have the largest manufacturing value chain, and this already is demonstrated by EV uh, value chain, by solar industry, uh, as well as by lithium battery, which in China we call it new three. So if you track the new three sector, uh, the export growth is very strong which help us to do further manufacturing upgrade. And thirdly is, I think I want to echo again, the animal spirit. 
I know a lot of you have Chinese, um, you know, a relationship or, you know, from your previous ancestors, and you know how hardworking Chinese people are. So I think given, you know, the big market and also given our already demonstrated competitive advantage, we will go forward in terms of globalization, which that's, that's the reason indeed why you see us in uh, Thailand in this room today. And you know, we were in Singapore last week, we will be in Korea next week, so we are everywhere. And we want to keep connected to the world, not like you know, um, our US, or, you know, the geopolitical tension, whatever, to, to, to the relationship. So I think, uh, again, you know, we want to remind uh, our investors, all of these competitive edge still exists, although in the last three years, there were a lot of factors that uh, kind of come to the very bad performance in China market, but we do have confidence it will come back. Uh, one point to add, coming back to the real investment, liquidity matters. Liquidity is a way how you can correct your risk how you can mitigate your risk in a rather liquid environment, how you can get them out. Honestly speaking, we're working on the secondary market. Sometimes I don't understand the industry as deep as my colleagues who is working on the primary market. But one of the benefits is I enjoy the secondary market liquidity. I can execute my investment ideas either in or out rather quick. If you're looking at the emerging markets in total, China is the second most liquid financial market in the world. And the biggest liquid financial markets comparing all other emerging market countries. So from this point of view, China is definitely still investable to my point. So I think one of the key words mentioned by Fujia and Bing is going abroad. So that sounds like the common characteristics for the new engine or the industries we think you know, will enjoy the future growth in China. So you also mentioned some sectors such as renewable energy, NEV, AI. But for exports, um, so we see it used to be a you know, good driver for Chinese GDP for the last few years. But we're also concerned about you know, the US-China tensions. So do you perceive any structural shift to exports in responding to you know the U.S. China tensions. So if I give you you know then put it into numbers, uh, it used to be that EU plus U.S. account for over fifty percent of China export, and now the number has dropped to forty percent or even less. However, what we want to emphasize is this is more than compensated by the non-U.S. countries. Actually, ASEAN countries is one of our top destinations, and also Middle East, Russia, you know, uh, the Belt and Road uh, so-called uh, countries. So uh, overall, that's why export has been continuously the biggest driver to China GDP growth in the last couple of years. And also, when you think about export, I want to uh, you know give you kind of the thesis behind what is driving the export and where you know the Chinese companies are going. So first is the thesis is driven by the manufacturing upgrade, which I have mentioned about the new three, which is solar, EV, and also lithium battery. So that's why you know these companies they are going like near shoring, fresh shoring countries to build their plants to be closer to the customers, to avoid the sanctions. And the second driver is actually capacity transfer, which I'm sure, you know, in uh, like ASEAN country like you and also in Vietnam, you have seen a lot of capacity coming into the countries. So capital goods is one of the sectors that benefits from this thesis. And last but not least, geopolitical risk. Yeah, indeed, in, from 2018, we all know that you know, trade friction between US and China started back in 2018. And that's why you have seen what we call self-sufficient investment theme worked very well. Uh, in terms of the sectors, that would be like semiconductor uh, sector that the companies are rapidly building up their uh, like technology and products 
to be catching up with our peers uh, globally. So all these three theses actually, as a result, benefit and result in a strong export growth. And Chinese companies are also going global behind these uh, secular trends. Great, so before we wrap up the session for macro and moving into investment themes and opportunities going forward, so I would like to open to the floor again to see if you have any questions around uh, uh, on uh, China macro. Yes. Oh, it's also, oh, okay. Yes, I got one question. How do you see, how do you see the chance of mainland China, which would like to uh, integrate Taiwan into their regime. How you see the chance and the challenges afterwards? I'm kind of expecting that. I'm flying to Taiwan. <laughs> Once again, to me, it's an idiosyncratic risk. Once again. There are some risks in the market that the investment professional can't predict. And there are some risks to be caught. That's definitely one of them. Normally, as an investment professional, what we do is uh, we do scenario analysis. If that happens, if not, then we're going to be the case. If this thing happens, first thing, it's within the Chinese community. It's definitely not something good to be celebrated. It's definitely, I mean, we all Chinese. Second one, looking at the chances now, I still believe this one can be handled in a peaceful and constructive way. It's, it's similar like we're talking about the U.S. and uh, China relationship after the election, something like that. This is just a, a risk, like, 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 like really high. Really beyond the investment professional point of view. But once again, the China valuation. Someone mentioned China valuation is not cheap. There's many ways looking at the valuations. If you're looking at the traditional PE valuations, it's, it's, it's very low. But some side, if you're looking at the equity risk premium, seems like it's not the case. And I did my own calculations. So where, where you get that ERP from? Equity risk premium. And I think he made a very interesting point. Is for Chinese equities, the risk-free risk is no longer the Chinese government bond yield. It becomes a US government bond yield. Why? It's because the foreign flow has played a really marginal, or bigger and bigger marginal force on the price movement. And all of these investments is actually anchored towards the US risk-free rates. This happened after 2022, when the China government yield is actually lower than the U.S. government yield. It's a sign of the growth, confident on the growth. Why I mention about this is I'm trying to take that, all of the risks mentioned earlier, a large portion of that has been priced in. If there's anything not priced in and cannot be predicted, I would say it's just the odds of uh, investments. What we can do with that is we shorten the investment durations if we really worry about the environment. Shorten the duration meaning we wouldn't invest a lot of things on high P, on very growth stream. We, we start to play defensive. We buy money market funds. We buy bond. We buy dividend yield. We buy low PBOP valuation stuff. That, that, that's just my take. Hope that helps. 
Great, thank you. So, okay, so with all the good discussions on a macro, let's move to investment opportunities. So I believe everyone sitting in, in this room, either they invest, you know, in the peak time and be heartbroken and sitting <laughs> in this room, yes. or they are holding some money in a more liquid asset like money market fund, thinking about when is the good window to tap into the China markets. So let's provide, let me provide some uh, data first. So in Thailand, we, we think there are around like 4.5 billion USD investments to China markets, which is quite significant. And China markets, compared to the lowest point in 2023, has already up 10% in 2024. But still, I think people are considering whether this momentum can be sustainable and whether the, uh, the beta still uh, exists in, in, in China markets. So let's start uh, with with Bing. So as a passive PM, so do you think so for for next year or going forward, whether we should play a beta uh, strategy or, or maybe an alpha strategy? So nowadays, I I sometimes ask my audience, what is the definition for beta? Is your beta CSI three hundred or MSCI China or CSI five hundred or CSI one thousand? There's many ways to think about beta. For this room, and easy for our discussion, let's, let's define beta is the broad-based China markets beta. In that way, my take is for the next two to three years, there may be more opportunities from the alpha side instead of from the beta side if your holding period is long enough. Second point is uh, beta or beta strategies has been used in China for many trading scenarios. Looking at our ETF, annual turnover rates is, can be three, four, five, six hundred times, meaning investors changing their hands every two to three months. So meaning they are not sticking to the beta, they trade on the beta. From that point of view, ETF or index funds is a very good vehicle to work on this. And also in China, uh, when the national team of regulators stepping into the market, ETF has been used as one of the tools as well. That's why from a business point of view or investment point of view, the value of ETF has been uh, reviewed. That's my take on beta. Fujian. Yeah, so, so Fujian, from the bottom up, so active equity perspective, how can we capture the alpha opportunities in China? What kind of sectors should we focus on? Sure, um, maybe before I answer this question, I want to do a quick survey. Like uh, from Grab, APP, any of you in the room has you know, being picked up by a BYD car. Please raise up your hand if you have. Nobody? <laughs> <laughs> well, my research analyst told me that he did channel checks. Actually, in Grab, you will see BYD, or maybe not many of them, but BYD is definitely on Grab uh, now. Seems like <laughs> which, I, more harder. which I look forward to, uh, to seeing one uh, pick up, picking me up. Anyway, so back to uh, sector opportunities. Um, so EV. Uh, the reason I mentioned, you know, uh, BYD is elect uh, electric vehicle is definitely one of the key investment themes that we think in the next three year, five years horizon you should look out for, which I'm sure you know audience in the room are already very familiar with. So if I give you uh, the numbers, like last year, 2023, globally the NEV unit is around 14 million, and out of 14 million, Chinese. NEV accounts for more than 60%. So as you as you already seen, China, you know, because of the manufacturing uh, competitive advantage, we have built the entire value chain from upstream materials to midstream, you know, all the elect uh, battery power, and then to downstream applications for the EV uh, value chain. So like BYD. Uh, already take over uh, Tesla in Q4 last year to be the number one EV player uh, in terms of sales volume in the world. And we do expect to see more and more uh, companies emerging to be the global leaders 
from the year onward. So EV is definitely one of the themes to uh, you know keep looking out for. And secondly, is the solar industry. Um, obviously, you know again, this is thanks to our manufacturing capability. Uh, we have managed to cut the photovoltaic costs by 90 percent, 90 percent between 2005 to 2019, and hence China has become the number one uh, solar industry suppliers to the whole world. For instance, we supply over 70 percent of the global modular in the solar industry. So this all demonstrates our uh, competitive advantage continuously in this area. So second key themes I would like to bring you attention is solar energy. And we do have products like uh, climate transition you know, to benefit from this uh, uh, secular trend. And last but not least is healthcare, which already been mentioned by the aging demographic, uh, you know, secular trend, where uh, healthcare is really enjoying the organic demand uh, because of the uh, cohort change or the structural change uh, in the Chinese population. But in addition, we also see trends of innovative drug and also medical devices going global. Again, back to our global globalization investment theme, which the whole world is seeing more and more pharmaceutical products produced by Chinese companies uh, in their product shelf. Great. So on the NEV, I would like to have uh, one you know further question. So we have been seeing um, this industry is actually very competitive, and in China we see the price war uh, among different you know NEV producers. So what exactly the opportunity, investment opportunities we should focus on? Is it the producer, the supply chain, or any others? Okay. Sure, that's a very good question. So for ones who closely watch the uh, stocks in the EV sector, you have seen the price cut you know, among the uh, EV OEMs, right? Um, so indeed, in China, within the domestic market, the penetration rate has kind of reached a peak. So there is less room, I would say, than compared to previously, these companies can continue capture. So that's why going global is a very important strategic investment for these companies. So I mentioned a lot about BYD, and BYD does have plants in Thailand. And also, you know, they have uh, plants in like Eastern Europe, and also many car companies going to like Mexico to, building, uh, to build their plants. So that's why Chinese companies, they need to find diversified source of income rather than just relying on domestic to continue gaining the global share. And the other thesis that I would like to highlight to you is also the intelligent components. So nowadays, if you come to China, if you look at the EV cars, the newly produced EV cars, you always see the big screen. HUD, you know, in every EV car. And similarly, there are a lot of so-called assistant tools or intelligent units attached to not only the EV cars, but also the traditional uh, passenger vehicle. And that's why you see the uh, within the component segment, there is rising penetration rate in terms of the uh, intelligent feature, so what we call from L2, L3, advanced to L4. That's another thing that can bring a bigger value uh, in terms of investment opportunities within the EV industry. So to answer your question in short, indeed, if you look for the whole value chain in Chinese uh, EV industry, you will find a lot of opportunities, as I mentioned about, due to globalization, due to intelligent advancement of the technology, as well as continuing increase in the penetration rate. Great, thank you. So uh, next question I would like to ask Bing. So now given that a lot of investors mentioned the valuation in China is already very cheap, very low, and what is your observation on overseas investments? Have you seen they start to move, they start to tap into the China markets? What is the asset class they are using at the moment? Yeah, I do. So for the past year, we've been traveling a lot around the globe to, to see, uh, to promote China stories and telling the good China stories. So what I can share is uh, most of the interest is coming from people states. People states meaning 
those states have a very close relationship with China and the U.S. in terms of the trades. But in the meantime, they're trying to maintain a neutral positions between two powers. This is including Middle East and Asian countries. For those regions or areas, we tend to see new fundings or new flows into Chinese market. Uh, for example, uh, for this year, early this year, we do see some large tickets actually going into China markets on fixed income because of the, the dropping of the yield. In the meantime, for other regions, uh, what I didn't mention, there's needs of a substitution for their existing investments. Overall, the allocation to China based on the data may be going down, but there's a shifting of hands. When they choose manager A from B to C, it's a, it's a rotation. Let's overall the pictures. For us, we have monthly data tracking the flow in and out. For the past one month, we see a strong coming back from uh, global investors to China markets, either using Stock Connect or using QFIO or QFIO channels. But once again, because most of the investors are momentum traders, if your market's doing well, then you know momentum trading will, will happen. In the long run, my personal taking is the flow from the global investors is going to be more selective. They're going to be number, number one, still looking for the companies have a rather obvious moat, meaning they can maintain their margin, also deliver a ROE, at least in the two digits. Second is those money, so flows, they will also do timings and rotations. That's what our observation tell us for the past three to four years. We also see the apps up and down. At least for now, for as Jim Jim mentioned, for the past one month, Chinese market enjoy a uh, shiny, sunshine journey yeah, after the Chinese New Year. Mm -hmm. Seems like it's re replenished and re refreshed. Uh, I think the whole market, including ourselves, is watching on the sustainabilities of the momentum. Yes, let's continue um, the discussion about the momentum. So what kind of signals we should observe to, to justify or to, you know, to understand whether this momentum can be sustainable? What are the key data or signals are you watching for? Oh, this is very trading, trading driven. So market price is driven by trading. It's basically supply and demand. The signals I would I would watch in the markets will be number one liquidity. What is the what is the liquidity trending for a week or months, etc. That's number one. Number number two, I will still be uh, watching very closely to the policy updates because this is a rather macro factor driven market instead of a micro driven. So. That's why the, the total volatility for Chinese market is actually going down for the past one year. That's number two. Number three, the signals I will be uh, I will be looking for is actually on the style rotation. So sometimes there could be a hurting events, hurting effect for either a growth sector versus a value sector, large cap versus the mid cap versus small cap. If any hurting signal emerge and if the market doesn't really give me a very strong organic signals i will be trying to be cautious on the investments and i do want to um maybe you know highlight one fact um many investors have the misconception that because the consumption was doing very badly last year so people or chinese people have no money actually if you observe the money market fund, or you know what we call wealth management products, last year we have seen huge flow into those ones, but out of China equity market for sure. 
what I, you know, the reason I, I'm saying this is Chinese people have deep pockets of wealth. So if some signal happens, as what we mentioned, then the money comes in, the domestic uh, customers like, like you, you know, coming back to the China equity market, that's a very tremendous power of growth or the liquidity growth for the whole market. So um, many people around me in China also feel very sad about the bad performance of China market. However, they do not know where else to invest. Mm -hmm. Obviously, the property prices have been down, all the you know, equity or asset management products were down. But remember, you know, 1.4 billion population with deep pockets of wealth, there is enough of momentum from liquidity perspective as long as the economic fundamentals come back, as long as the confidence comes back. Actually, one of the very positive signals I observe is on the flight from Shanghai to Bangkok. The flight is full. So it used to be half full, 80% full, but now it's all full. So I think that's a very positive sign. And also the long queue in the custom. <laughs> the long queue in the custom. So, so that's a good sign. And also long queue at the spa. Houseland. A massage. A massage. Very hard to get a spot. <laughs> okay, so let's, uh, let's open to the floor again because I think uh, some of you did talk to us this morning asking whether it's a good window to invest. Will 2024 be a good year? So, yeah, I would like to open to the floor to take any questions. Yes. As you mentioned that you see China will have like gradual recovery this year, I think maybe it may require confidence from both company to produce more and consumer to buy more. Do you have like clear signs of this that companies return to invest and uh, consumers want to buy more? And what is it? So um. Maybe I, I just give you the background. Again, China economy is driven by investment. Although we are moving to the direction of consumption driven, export driven, etc., etc., but currently the business model or the model of Chinese economy is investment driven. So if you think about that, consumption or income always comes at the end of the economic cycle. That's why during the last three years, because of property leveraging, because of the you know, less wealth effect, and the companies are out of the business cycle, then that's why you know, in terms of income effect, in terms of expectations from the consumers, currently it's very low. However, as long as we work out of the economic cycle where consumers see more income from their companies, which means companies experience more profits from the whole uh, economy recovery, then that will translate to the so-called consumption power and wealth effect. So to answer your question short, indeed, how long does it take? We think we have to work out of the journey, but we are confident as long as the transition is smoothly, you know, we are smoothly going through the transition, then at the end of the day, consumers' confidence will come back just as I mentioned, we'll come back to the Asia market. Thank you. Any other questions from this side? I have a question. Oh, yes, sure. Excuse me, the question is about the real estate market. One curve is another company facing problem. What will be impact on the economy and equity markets? And also, real estate, real estate sector contribute more than 20% to GDP and home owner account for around 96% of population. Will this can be a headwind for China recovery? Property market is definitely uh, directly or indirectly accounts for 20% of China GDP. And if you're looking at the downstream, it's probably 50 or 60% of the consumption of GDP. Uh, I'm not a uh, property sector analyst, but what I can share with you is number one, again, as mentioned earlier, 
property going to gradually become a pure fundamental leading tools instead of a leading tools plus a financial tool. Number two, during the transitions, there may be more events happening. Not limited to like a default or, or any, 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 any market driven news, etc. Meaning there could be more turmoil in the property market. Number three, if you're looking at the fundamental and if you're looking at many angles, so basically the, the, the municipal government funding or the government funding, uh, the property or land finance, etc. I think Chinese market will, will gradually reaching to the bottom. At the bottom level, people still need is housing. People still need is improvement in their housing qualities. There still needs. Um, there, there's many research papers on China, like like trying to learning the lessons or, or learning learning what's doing well in the Singapore markets. Um, uh, what do we call the rental housing? Etc. So putting all of these pictures together, what I think will happen is the policy makers can fine tuning the policies around property markets to making sure this is a soft landing instead of a crash. Number two, again as mentioned earlier, the valuation model or the investment cases for property markets. Actually, this is probably gonna move from not the secondary markets, even from the banking or the primary markets, will be changing in China. And number three, time is healing. Given the time, the composition of China flagship indices, I think, or going towards the direction of what's happening in the U.S. The new economy gonna account for a bigger and a bigger proportion of the index. If I looking at the China major index 10 years ago, 20 years ago, the top 10 constituents already changed a lot. It's from a property to internet. Internet is another interesting uh, sector and changing now to many new energy or manufacturing or banking uh, names. I think this transition will, will continue happening. Also, this, this transition is gonna produce opportunities for both beta and alpha. Great, thank you. So, really enjoyed the conversation, but um, to, to wrap up the session, I would like to invite Bing and Fu Jia to give one last sentence to summarize the key takeaway for the audience here. Oh, okay, yeah, sure, sure. <laughs> How will President, U.S. President outcome the China economy? Wow, it's a thesis question, PhD thesis. <laughs> I think we haven't given enough opportunities for Jing Jing for any questions. <laughs> <laughs> please, please, please. <laughs> Presidential elections. That's actually a question in, uh, in this morning's uh, panel. So I see Freeman's here. Uh, we talked about the same questions. Again, U.S. 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 elections or many countries' elections, it's a serious incredible risk to me. If so many bad news have to be priced in Chinese equity valuations, so unless the uh, U.S. election become an event that can be even more dramatic than what happened in the past 40 years. Yeah, 40 years or 50 years, coming back to after the uh, many, many times ago. I still think the effect has been priced in. And once again, we as an investment professional really can predict the outcome. Also, will the market can be react to that one. So I'm still a big believer on diversification. And I hope the uh, part of the diversification is still coming to China. Great, I'll take that as your key summary for today. And over to Bu Jia. Um, okay, so um, maybe the last sentence from me is, if you, you are a long-term investor, do look out for China. 
given current valuation is very attractive. China market is such a big market that you cannot ignore. But even if you're a short-term investor, do look out for China. Obviously, as we mentioned about liquidity, the momentum, and also you always see a V-shaped rally, you know, easily <laughs> happening in a week also. So yeah, please look out for China. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Very honestly, as a company or as an individual, we cannot please everybody. We probably are spending most of the time is looking for someone having the same frequency as us. So that's also coming back for our investment. But we actually trying to serve the uh, the type of investors sharing the same co value with us. Yeah, and for our companies is definitely the wrong one. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. So let's put our hands together for the and Mr. Jack.